today we've got a very special guest as our luncheon speaker. No luncheon, but you know how it is under COVID. Somebody that the New York Times has called the most important economist in the world, but I think of him also as one of the most important activists and leaders and cheerleaders for getting us all to understand the very special nature of what we call the sustainable development goals. The global goals for sustainable development that we're using to guide our aspirations for the next now 10 years. That opportunity, the sustainable development goals, you'll be hearing more about from our very special guest, who's been one of our main uh, partners in this work around the SDGs, as they're sometimes called, uh, Por Vivat, who's the president of the Medtronic Foundation and one of the leaders in creating the national and international associations of the companies and organizations who've been mobilizing their employees, their team members, their partners to be part of bringing those sustainable development goals to life and to reaching those aspirational objectives, those targets. Uh, Porvi is somebody who knows the SDGs deeply from her work over the years in health and public health, HIV, AIDS, and others. Porvi, thank you so much for being with us. And I turn the microphone over to you to introduce our luncheon speaker. Oh, well, Mark, thank you so very much. And, and hello to everyone who's uh, listening in and watching us today. And listen, I am uh, a little more than just a girl fan of what we're just going to be listening to with, uh, with Jeff and uh, all of his uh, perspectives on what's happening today. And uh, more than just the aspiration of zero hunger, but the, the reality of what it will take to get us there. Um, rather than going through his CV, and I think we can all take a look at that uh, online and a variety of materials that are out there, let me just give you a sense of why uh, this moment is so important for us and, and why Jeff. Um, I'll take you back a little bit to my own history. Um, I was uh, a public health uh, recent grad and had some training in uh, population economics way back in the day. And well before there was a therapy for HIV, um, was working at CARE, um, doing a, a lot of uh, international development work and was faced with figuring out how do we bring food assistance, micro uh, enterprise work and, uh, and health together in an HIV response. And I followed the work of Jeff and Mead Over and Martha Ainsworth and a huge tribe of economists at that time to help us solve what can we do in a time of uh, that pandemic, which is still a pandemic today? Um, what can we do in a time when we need to come together and how do we think across sectors? So as a young professional then, uh, who's deep in looking at food assistance and health and responding to a pandemic, it is just such an honor to be here today in the roles that we all play. Uh, you know, Medtronic, of course, has been a part of the COVID response as I am sure uh, many have been following. Um, but we're also a part of the social injustice uh, response given what has happened with George Floyd and uh, in the Twin Cities and beyond and the response that's happened around the world. I think this moment in time um, is really bringing forward the importance of coming together. And frankly, when you're in Minnesota, um, and I was raised here and came back here uh, for this role, um, it isn't the coming together, it's in the being together and staying together. And everything that we're talking about today uh, no matter the silo or the SDG is really about how we bring all of those ingredients together. Uh, the role of the private sector and the importance of groups like Impact 2030 um, is really in translating the full set of assets that we have, not just the financial ones, but also the, the resources that highly skilled employees that work for our companies can bring to this problem. Uh, they come to these issues with a variety of different sectoral um, expertise. They also come with an expectation that we will change the world together. Um, it, we are this generation that does come together. And when we, if you look back to what happened with HIV and companies at that time, and you fast forward to today and look at what happened with companies uh, in the COVID response, it is a dramatic change. And you can see that every sector got involved, uh, whether you were in healthcare or in apparel, you found a way to get involved in COVID. And so with all of this is uh, how we consider even how food, uh, together with healthcare, together with finance, together with so much more, needs to come together in, in our zero hunger response and to look at things from the perspective of the ground up. 
Um, I'm so pleased and honored to uh, invite Jeff to this uh, to the stage if we had one um, and to uh, guide us in thinking through this time together and to inspire the next generation of those of us that are here to fight the good fight. So thank you, Jeff, so much for, for the words you're going to say. Thanks for uh, being so generous to uh, let me uh, share a few thoughts with people. I hope you are at lunch wherever you are and uh, enjoying and um, uh, watching uh, online uh, in uh, these weird days. Let me thank uh, Mark Ritchie and his leadership at Global Minnesota and also uh, the World Affairs Councils for this important day. It's a lot of leadership, uh, Parvi and Mark, that you are um, showing today to take this World Food Day and use it as an opportunity for thinking and brainstorming and planning and mobilizing our activities together. Boy, if we did this systematically and we did this more often, we really would be solving a lot of problems. And uh, I'm very gratified uh, that Global Minnesota is taking this on. And I hope that what we mostly uh, get out of today is the commitment to think together and then act together to address the range of problems that we're confronting. Obviously, we're living through uh, the biggest disruption in modern history worldwide and in our nation. Uh, this pandemic is unrivaled for the last hundred years since the flu pandemic uh, one century ago. The economic shocks are unbelievable. I've, I've been a uh, practicing economist for 40 years. There's nothing like this since the Great Depression, uh, what's happening. The rise of inequality in our country and worldwide just in a few months is beyond belief. The people at the top have seen their wealth soar this year, whereas half the country is desperate. Uh, what's gonna happen to our jobs? What's gonna happen to our uh, income? Can we put enough uh, food uh, on the table day by day in the United States, much less uh, in the world? You know, it's amazing to me that four Americans, four, uh, uh, Jeffrey Bezos, Bill Gates, Mark Zuckerberg, and Elon Musk, names that we know well, those four today have net worth of $530 billion, <laughs> beyond comprehension, and uh, 100 million Americans have nothing right now and uh, are trying to survive. And while Usually when we think about uh, World Food Day uh, and uh, the World Food Program and the global crisis, we think about countries abroad. The Census Bureau is bringing us absolutely alarming data month by month in its pulse surveys showing that one in seven households right now, uh, even closer to one in six households, is with ch one in six with children, I should uh, be clear, did not have enough to eat during the past seven days in the September survey of the Census Bureau. We have massive hunger in the United States in this crisis. It has soared in the past year. It will get worse until we finally get a a national government that is organized, thoughtful, uh, caring, compassionate, or, uh, and able to think and do things. We haven't had that for a while. We desperately need a federal government that is coherent, mentally <laughs> balanced, that we can actually move forward and solve some of these urgent problems. The situation worldwide is of course far more dramatic, although it's dramatic enough in the United States. Hundreds and hundreds of millions of people 
I have no doubt are falling into extremely grave hunger right now. We don't have the numbers exactly. And the numbers that we use characteristically uh, that the uh, WFP, the World Food Program, this year's Nobel Laureate in Peace, uh, FAO, great institutions, but the numbers that we use from them don't really uh, capture the full extent of the hunger crisis, even in normal years. And now we're scrambling to understand what's happening. My guess is that there is soaring hunger across uh, the world that we have not yet registered. The reason I believe that is that in every part of the world, with very few exceptions, national incomes are way down. Unemployment has increased by hundreds of millions of workers. Remittance income has collapsed in many places. Tourist income has collapsed in many places. Commodities export earnings have fallen sharply in many places. So you figure what's happening to the poorest people in these places, no doubt the situation is desperate. And one of the main points that I think we need to uh, have is uh, daily metrics, something that we're not so good at, but we need to have really uh, our uh, fingers on the pulse worldwide to know where there is emergent hunger crisis, uh, because often you don't get to uh, play this twice. People will die when they don't have the basic nutrients that they need, and they will be swept away by COVID-19 or by countless other infectious diseases if they are deeply uh, undernourished. And no doubt this is rising sharply. What a mess. And uh, what do we do about it? Well, I think the first thing to say is, uh, as Parvi uh, mentioned about the AIDS crisis 20 years ago, something that she and I worked on, the way to address any crisis like this is by systematic, uh, a systematic approach. We have to understand the where's and the why's of hunger and how those challenges can be addressed systematically and at scale. And that's not a happy speech and not a commitment to ending hunger. It's hard work of getting the numbers right and of understanding what kind of approaches can apply. 20 years ago, just as an example, uh, with AIDS, uh, the epidemic was running completely out of control. I uh, was in a position as a chairman of a commission for the World Health Organization to look at the hows and the whys. What could we really do? And one thing was absolutely obvious, which was that millions of people were dying every year because they didn't have access to the life-saving antiretroviral medicines. And the main reason that they didn't have access to those antiretrovirals is that they were very poor people. And so the question was practically, how could one set up a, a, a supply chain from the companies that produce these antiretrovirals to people who were dying uh, because of lack of them and uh, have the costs covered? And I, I proposed at the time a special fund uh, which became known as the Global Fund to Fight AIDS, Tuberculosis, and Malaria. And Kofi Annan, then Secretary General of the UN, uh, launched the Global Fund in March 2001. And who was the first leader to say, yes, we're in? That was George W. Bush, Jr. Uh, and uh, Kofi Annan stood with President Bush in the Rose Garden in May 2001 and got the Global Fund off the ground. And since then, countless millions of people every year are alive because the Global Fund has been funding the basic costs of 
uh, producing and distributing antiretroviral drugs to people who would otherwise be dead. Very practical, very systematic, very management-based, very numbers-based, and sometimes this is exactly what it needs to be done. There was no marketplace that was going to solve that. Uh, but private companies that did have markets in high-income countries were ready to participate in problem solving for low-income countries. Well, the World Food Program, uh, incidentally, the Nobel laureate this year, is designed for emergency food relief. And uh, the United States was the great champion of the World Food Program historically and of the Food and Agriculture Organization itself because the US after World War II took the lead in arguing uh, that we could have a system, uh, including uh, the vast US uh, production of grains that could help to end poverty and hunger worldwide. But the problem is we still don't have adequate funding and a way, especially in a deep crisis like we have right now, to ensure that those who need the food get the food. So one very practical thing that I would recommend strongly, and I will continue to push the point this year, is that the real location of emergency financing right now for poor countries is the International Monetary Fund. It is the lender of last resort for much of the world. They don't have the Fed uh, to print currency for them. We've had trillions of dollars of new credits issued by the Fed, but uh, the countries uh, in Africa, the poor countries in Asia, in Central America, they can't uh, turn to the Fed. They have to turn to emergency financing, and that's the IMF. And I would like to see the IMF and the World Food Program and the Food and Agriculture Organization work intensively together day by day with situation analysis that is up to date uh, and that is timely to ensure that nobody is dying because they don't have the income or their governments lack the revenues to provide the food that is needed. We must not have mass death on our watch worldwide because of uh, COVID-19. There is the food in the world. There is the production capacity in the world. There isn't the buying power for poor people. And this is not the time to check on your balance sheets and your credit worthiness and your debt sustainability nor is it possible, unfortunately, to go around and ask governments for emergency food aid. Try that with President Trump. You're not going to get very far, unfortunately. Try that with Mitch McConnell. It's just not happening. We're going to need to use multilateral financing and companies like Cargill and others who can move massive amounts of food, working together with the World Food Program to prevent disaster. All of this requires thinking and planning and high level engagement of the multilateral institutions, especially IMF, WFP, and FAO, together with the major companies like Cargill, together with uh, the governments in low income settings, together with real-time information systems that can allow us to address this. And finally, we need governments that care to do this. And so I'm hoping that the United States will enter 2021 with a government that can think, can act decently, can do what George W. Bush Jr. did in 2001, which was jump to the front of the line and say, we're in because we're good and we're decent people and we will contribute to global problems. Just about the opposite of what's happened this year when for political reasons, Trump abruptly pulled out of the World Health Organization at the height of the most severe pandemic in modern history. 
Uh, it is a, a shame on our country that this happened, and it is a disaster for the world. Uh, and it was for absolute domestic politics. It's not because China did this or China did that. It's because Trump is appealing to uh, his base who wants to hear all the anti-China venom they can. And in this thoughtless response, WHO became just a plaything. When we need WHO more urgently than ever as a linchpin of global cooperation. So this is the first point that I want to emphasize. We have a hunger crisis in the United States, and we have an even more shocking hunger crisis worldwide. And we need urgent, focused, fiscal, and administrative systems attention to address this. This cannot be sorted out by the marketplace. We're talking about extraordinarily poor and vulnerable people. But let me put this challenge even in uh, a bigger context, because the food system itself worldwide is in deep crisis. And this is because the food system, which is at the core of our survival, after all, the core of livelihoods of the single biggest sector in the world of employment, the agriculture, sector is caught up in the range of instabilities of the environment, of geopolitics, of widening income inequalities, meaning that the crisis of hunger is even larger than the urgent crisis caused by COVID-19. And here, let me give you a pre-COVID-19 picture, and I hope soon a post COVID-19 picture uh, of how big the challenges are. The typical number that was used uh, until recently for worldwide hunger was about 800 million people. But if you look below uh, that headline number, that was a number referring to basically caloric intake uh, or uh, maybe energy protein sufficiency not a healthy diet, not micronutrient adequacy, uh, not what uh, proper eating should be. If you look beyond that, there are good studies, in fact, volumes and volumes of studies, and the state of the food insecurity report of FAO this year was completely alarming because they said, okay, take the hunger, that's 800 million, dreadful. But what about adding in the need for a balanced diet, including the micronutrients and including a good balance of the different uh, classes of food? You know what they found? They found that 3 billion people, 3 billion people could not afford a healthy diet right now. And we know that that's not some crazy number. How could it be 3 billion? Because if you take the number that are counted as hungry in this energy protein basis, add in those who suffer from micronutrient deficiencies, we do add another 2 billion plus to the column. If you add in, in our country and other countries, uh, the people who are suffering from obesity, uh, and therefore from imbalanced diets, and sometimes because those are the cheapest ways to get the calories, because the healthy legumes and fruits and uh, uh, plant-based proteins could be more expensive in the diet, then uh, you add in another billion people around the world. And so our baseline, even aside from COVID, is that half the world's population does not have healthy diets right now. That's an even larger crisis that needs to be faced. And part of it is changing what we are producing because the evidence is very clear that we need more legumes, uh, more fruits in the diet, uh, more uh, vegetable oils, less beef most likely, 
uh, which is uh, something that uh, some people don't want to hear. Uh, but this is uh, also part of rearranging the diets and addressing the planetary needs. So we have a food system challenge even beyond the challenge of poverty and conflict that leads to the acute undernourishment of so many people and the epidemic uh, this year on top of that uh, dreadfully uh, worsening the situation. But there's another layer which we're all increasingly aware of, and that is that agriculture is deeply implicated in the multiple environmental crises that are simultaneously ravaging the planet. And boy, this is a mess because we face not one or two, but actually fully four environmental crises at unprecedented scale right now. One is COVID-19 and similar zoonotic diseases, which occur because of dislocations of natural balances with human populations. This new disease emerged when a coronavirus in the horseshoe bat populations of Southwest China uh, was transferred to humans somehow, maybe through excrement, uh, bat urine somehow picked up by farmers in Southwest China, and then started the, uh, the epidemic phenomenon. And this kind of emerging disease is coming from dislocating animal populations so that they transfer emerging viruses, whether it's this one, SARS-CoV-2, or whether it was SARS, or whether it's the Middle East Respiratory Syndrome, or the Nipah virus, or the Zika virus, or uh, Ebola, which is another uh, bat zoonotic uh, disease, that one from fruit bats. Uh, but this kind of dislocation is environmental crisis number one. Environmental crisis number two, of course, is climate change. This will be most likely the hottest year in history this year. And again, because we have unserious politics and unserious leaders, we just sit there, even as the forest fires blaze, even as the heat waves blaze, even as the floods uh, batter uh, the uh, coastline of uh, the Gulf uh, states uh, and so on. We're just sitting there faking it. Trump says, oh, it's going to get colder sometime. Are you kidding? Even our Supreme Court nominee now said, oh, I don't know if uh, climate change is real. That's science. I haven't studied that. Are you kidding? Are you really kidding? After 30 years of nonstop science and all the disasters that we're facing, it's a game, but we cannot live in a game anymore. We have to live with solutions. So that's crisis number two. Crisis number three is the destruction of habitat, the loss of biodiversity, the collapse of pollinator populations that we know well in North America, but the loss of species all over the world destroying the Amazon rainforest, more fires, more uh, forest destruction taking place because the President Bolsonaro doesn't care. And this is uh, the third major disaster. And the fourth one is pollution everywhere. Mega pollution of the air, the water, the oceans. Oh God. So we need a food system that fits within a sustainable world. That's a tough challenge. In Minnesota, you've got some of the most sophisticated farming in the world. We need sophisticated farming, high yield farming that can produce healthy crops, can produce the right mix of crops so that we have healthy diets around the world and can do so in an environmentally sustainable manner without the toxic persistent pollutants without new deforestation occurring, with resilience to worsening conditions of water management, temperature management, uh, thermal stress uh, that is resulting, 
and in a way that contributes to solving the environmental problems. So with climate change, farming is both a victim, but unfortunately also a cause, a cause through the release of carbon dioxide from degraded soils or from deforested regions. And we need a regenerative agriculture to be a solution alongside the food production so that we're storing more carbon in the soils. Uh, we are regenerating degraded lands. We're reforesting degraded lands. We're using natural systems approaches to pest management. We're not destabilizing uh, animal uh, reservoirs that will lead to yet more pandemics in the future. This is the large context of the food challenge that we face. So we face the humanitarian emergency today, but we face the challenge of sustainability for the generation to come. That is a food system worldwide that is prosperous for farmers, a good livelihood in uh, healthy farm communities that produce the food in an environmentally sustainable way, produce a mix of food that is healthy for the population, and produces food in a way which contributes to the solutions of our environmental crises, the four uh, interconnected and still growing environmental crises. It's a tall order, but as uh, Parvi said, and as Mark said, we have technologies, solutions, wonderful companies with a global reach. We have the means to solve these problems. What we have lacked in recent years is a politics of problem solving that says we want solutions for better lives and well being of our people, not political games, not struggles for power, not voter repression. Uh, not jamming through legislation in the middle of the night or by executive order. We need problem solving in which Americans do what they do best, which is cooperate, think in a forward way, innovate in technologies, and think at scale. So I want to thank Global Minnesota for exactly being in that spirit and for bringing us together on World Food Day this is a huge challenge we face, but it's so, for me, very inspiring to know that you're on the case. And uh, I wanna help uh, in any way uh, as you lead in this effort. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Professor Sachs. And one of the things that we've found a real uh, community in terms of thinking about how we find solutions is in fact the Sustainable Development Solutions Network, which you helped create and help lead. I was really uh, dramatically impressed because I met so many young leaders uh, from Singapore, from all over the planet. Could you share a little bit of where the idea came from for that network, how it has unfolded to be such a powerful force and where it might go and how we might keep throwing fuel onto that fire? Mark, thanks a lot, and thanks for those nice words. And I, I also am inspired by what that network is accomplishing because uh, I've helped to get it started, but watching it take off is, uh, is really uh, great. I mean, my, my basic idea uh, at the outset of this was uh, very simple and something that I observed uh, and really treasured in my own life. Uh, I sometimes say I never quite got a job because uh, I went to school uh, as a five-year-old uh, back in 1959, and I've never left school. Uh, so uh, I uh, went, went through school uh, and uh, then stayed on, on university faculty, first at Harvard, now at Columbia. I, I really like going to school, so uh, it's been 60 years of that. <laughs> but uh, I'm a big believer that our universities have an incredible amount to offer because they are universal in the topics that they take on. Uh, take University of Minnesota or so many great universities uh, in Minnesota. Uh, and you go through the faculties, you know, you'll have agronomy, you'll have uh, energy uh, engineering, you'll have public policy, uh, politics, uh, economics, 
sociology, uh, and so on. And my view is this is the powerhouse of problem solving. Uh, and we need to get our universities out there engaged. So I've had a very good time doing that both at Harvard and now uh, I've loved uh, the uh, 18 years that I've been at Columbia because Columbia created the Earth Institute and I was uh, head of that for 14 years and I just thought it was the most fantastic thing that uh, the law school, uh, the teacher's college, uh, school of social work, school of public health, medical school, uh, arts and sciences all came together to work together on the problems of sustainable development. So to make a, uh, a long and my favorite story <laughs> short, uh, Ban Ki-moon, uh, Secretary General, uh, uh, asked me to help put together a knowledge network for the SDGs. Uh, we started even before there were SDGs to help make suggestions about what could be the sustainable development goals. And we've been at it for eight years. There are now uh, 1,300 universities worldwide. Uh, there are 60 national networks, including SDSN USA. And SDSN USA, by the way, is uh, looking to launch a zero hunger project for the United States to bring together universities around the US, all around the theme. Let's make sure that in the United States, we don't have hunger. And this would be a great topic for 2021. We're finishing right now a university wide study on how to decarbonize our energy system by mid century, because that's part of the climate change solution that mm -hmm. we need. But we could do together a fantastic nationwide project of getting the incredible scientists, nutritionists, agronomists around the country together, working on ending hunger in the US and making suggestions to the state legislature, state governments, and the federal government for this. And I think it's what a network like this can help to accomplish. That's a great, that's an exciting idea. Horvey, jumping in. This is really exciting and I'm, uh, you know, it takes me back, of course it does, to, to the days that we shared together during the HIV movement. And you know, it's the thing that is missing today, and I just love that you brought it up, it's unfortunate, um, but is, the, is the, the galvanizing power of just people rolling up their sleeves and trying to figure this out now. Um, and so you know, how do you stay inspired in this? We're seeing so many young people uh, rise up in ways that we couldn't have imagined even then around these issues. Um, and yet the gap, as you rightly state, in really just sitting down now and, and uh, getting over some of the political hurdles is what's needed next. How do you stay inspired in this and what can we do uh, knowing that those hurdles are there? Um, there were hurdles back then too, and yet somehow we got over them. Um, so I think just a couple of, of thoughts there would be super helpful. Absolutely. You know, one of the best parts of being at a university and uh, being a, an, an old guy like me now, uh, having uh, seen it from uh, all different sides, is it's your students that keep you completely going because you have no right to become cynical. This is their world. <laughs> they, they want a good world. They don't want to hear somebody say, oh, it's impossible to do. That's ridiculous. Uh, we, we need the young people's energy and intelligence, and they're much better at uh, every digital thing than we are. <laughs> so uh, it's uh, really important to mobilize all of that as well. And for me, you know, the, uh, the ironic thing is in our polarized politics, I'm not a partisan at, at all, though I make a, a lot of remarks about our current government, which I don't like, but that's not on a partisan basis when, uh, Back uh, 19 years ago, George W. Bush Jr. led the fight against AIDS, uh, a Republican president. I was a little surprised, uh, frankly, uh, but uh, he took it up and created not just uh, the U.S. Uh, being the first member in the world of the Global Fund to Fight AIDS, be Malaria, but also the U.S. PEPFAR program, which was an incredible, uh, it continues until now, uh, $3 billion a year to fight global AIDS, uh, a bold initiative. Uh, he created uh, what was uh, called PMI, the President's Malaria Initiative. These were wonderful initiatives. Then uh, 
<laughs> you know, when President Obama was elected, it was a financial crisis, but I was in the White House soon afterwards. And I said, oh, Mr. President, we need to expand this. Uh, and uh, he said, well, you know, we don't have the votes in Congress. I never agreed with that, by the way, because this can be a bipartisan effort in our country, precisely. Uh, this is not a Democratic or Republican Party effort. So this is another very practical point. You know, America looks so polarized right now. We will not make it as a country with this kind of polarization. And, uh, you know, it's awful, uh, this mood. We really can cooperate in this country. It's not naive to say so. I know it. Uh, I'm a Midwesterner. I grew up in the Detroit area. Uh, and uh, I know the Midwest. I know the coast. Supposedly, they can't work together. Nonsense. <laughs> this is something that a, a national effort can mean. So I want to empower young people. I want to get our country together around these. I mean, I want to help, not uh, sounding so grandiose. But I want to see our country acting together, not acting in this ridiculous way of looking at who's a red state, who's a blue state, and, and so on. But I want us also to get back to pragmatic stuff, uh, which is uh, we're pretty good problem solvers. If we say, here's the problem, here's the timeline, what does it cost, how can it be done, what can the private sector add, what can the public sector add, you put aside all the ideology, you keep the problem in front of you, then we can solve this. And again, you know, I'm, uh, I, I am uh, inevitably a creature of the 1960s. So for me, my you know, first moments of political consciousness were President Kennedy. And I vividly recall sitting at the side of the radio, listening to Alan Shepard's first suborbital launch in 1961. I really remember that. I remember watching uh, John Glenn's launch in 1963, I think it is, uh, for the orbit. Uh, and I certainly remember watching people walk on the moon uh, in the summer of 1969. President Kennedy said, I believe that this country should adopt the goal before this decade is out of sending a man to the, safely to the moon and returning him safely to the Earth. Whoa. The president said, before the end of the decade is out, let's do this. And then through this genius of NASA and 20,000 private companies that contributed to it, there was, eight years later, there was a, a Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin walking on the moon. Uh, and so to my mind, this is what we ought to do. And I hope the next president says by 2030, no more hunger in this country. Uh, and uh, we're going to achieve the sustainable development goals and we're going to make a safe climate and so on. Because I think Americans would rally like crazy. Good. Time for problem solving. That's what we're good at. I want to connect this just to one thing that both of you have been part of, which you brought it up just now, the PEPFAR. Uh, the incredible program, George W. Bush, and, and how that is. I've been out trying to convince heads of state and foreign ministers to bring a World's Expo, World's Fair to Minnesota on SDG3. Yay! When I'm talking to them, <laughs> they'll stop me in mid-sentence and say, let me tell you one thing. PEPFAR saved our continent. They stopped me and tell me how important PEPFAR was to them. They may not like a whole lot of other things, but they bring this point home. But I had a responsibility. Mark, can, Mark, can I tell you a story? Oh, sorry, I don't yeah, want to Yeah, well, up. let me just say that when I was res responsible as our Secretary of State, I was on the, the advisory board for our National Guard. And our National Guard, about a thousand young men and women, trained for a year, a little more than a year, to be the back office for the Ebola battle in West Africa. And about a month out, that mission was canceled. Now, we were proud of being asked to be that. People were very, very well trained. Everybody was nervous, of course. We were relieved when they didn't have to go. But what we found out was that the investments made for PEPFAR had built a public health infrastructure that Bravo. would turn 
to stop that Ebola crisis. And stopping that Ebola crisis meant that these young men and women from Minnesota didn't have to take that one mission aboard. They were able to stay home with their sweethearts and their families and their farms and everything else. So we never know all of the connections, but if we dig deep enough, as you were describing, we can see how what you fought for and what was done and George W. Bush made happen will help Minnesota get the right to host a World's Fair. I know that, but it also meant that there was a ending of a crisis that was tacking young people from around the world to come help because that investment had been made. And that's the kind of thing that I know, the more people know these stories, the more we reinforce what both of you have said is the American people want to help and they want it to be practical and they want to know what they're doing and how. Mark, it's incredible. Uh, and I'll tell you just quickly, if we have time, just a quick story sure. about that, which is that um, I was in the White House uh, a couple of uh, sessions uh, with the Condoleezza Rice uh, in uh, February 2001. Uh, I was pitching an AIDS program uh, and saying we really could, uh, we could do this. Uh, and uh, Condi Rice was fantastic. Uh, and uh, eventually, uh, you know, this is what happened. Uh, but uh, a couple of things for me are notable. The, the great partner in, I was then working with the UN, who was my partner uh, in discussing this uh, with President Bush was Tony Fauci, uh, who was, uh, yeah, he was uh, already director of uh, NIAID. Tony was fantastic. And the thing that I saw about Tony, by the way, then uh, was that for absolutely the right reasons, George W. Bush Jr. trusted him. So Tony Fauci told the president, this is feasible. And I have no doubt that was the decisive point uh, because Tony is so credible, so decent uh, that uh, he spoke, uh, President Bush reacted and, 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 and acted. The other funny story was a, a former student uh, and then colleague of mine was uh, the president's economic advisor uh, and uh, <laughs> terrific person, Larry Lindsay. And after the first meeting that I had with uh, Condoleezza Rice, uh, he led me out uh, the West Wing uh, entrance of the White House uh, and uh, put his arm around me, said, Jeff, that was a terrific presentation, but frankly, three billion, you don't stand a chance. Uh, it's not gonna happen. And, uh, and uh, you know, I listened and he was the president's economic advisor and I was the guest at the White House that day. And then Condi called me back, said, I'd like to have another hour in the situation room with you. Uh, and uh, sure enough, it did happen <laughs> afterwards. So I think with politics also, you don't know because you know people do want to do the right thing and what's yeah. called politically impossible is almost never politically impossible. If it's sensible, decent, and the right thing to do, people will absolutely Go, not only go along with it, they'll be enthusiastic about it. Amen. Amen. Well, well we're, we're near the end, end of the time, time that we were uh, so grateful to get from both of you for today's panel, but we also got some uh, marching orders about 2021 and the possibility of really taking seriously that the SDGs apply to the whole planet. SDG 2, Zero Hunger here at home and abroad. And so uh, I said to Governor Beasley this morning, uh, who was an incredible kind of kickoff for us, like one year from now, it's always October 16th, we need to gather again and say, how did we do? We had another year. How did we do? And so I want to pick up on that challenge that you presented. And now I know to check in on the network and see what's happening there. Mark, it would be such a pleasure to work together on this. Uh, let's make it happen and make uh, the governor proud of uh, what we're doing. Yes, yes. Horvey, thank you so much. You get the last word. Oh my. Well, there. Uh, first of all, you both have been such a such an incredible pair to watch and listen to. And uh, 
There will be a Zoom call 20 years from now, maybe. Maybe it'll be hieroglyphics then. <laughs> Who knows what it'll be? But they will come back and remember this time. And, uh, and we'll have stories to share the way that we're sharing them today. And I really hope that when they do share the stories, it's going to be because we answered this call and then we did what was needed from us. So, um, you know, with that, I, I really thank everyone for the time today. And, uh, and Jeff, thank you for everything you've done. Oh, what a pleasure and honor to be with both of you. Thanks so thank much. You. Thank you much. Everybody.